Bhagavad Gita as it is. Chapter 16 contains 24 verses and is entitled Divine and Demoniac Natures. In the first three verses, Krishna gives a quick summary of 26 divine qualities. Then the rest of the chapter is an in-depth discussion of the demoniac qualities. Please listen now as Krishna describes the 26 divine qualities. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, Fearlessness purification of one's existence, cultivation of spiritual knowledge, charity, self-control, performance of sacrifice, study of the Vedas, austerity, simplicity, nonviolence, truthfulness, freedom from anger, renunciation, tranquility, aversion to fault-finding, compassion for all living entities, freedom from covetousness, gentleness, modesty, steady determination, vigor or the active strength of the body or mind, forgiveness, fortitude or the strength of mind that enables one to endure hardship with courage, cleanliness, and freedom from envy and freedom from the passion for honor. These transcendental qualities, O son of Bart, belong to godly men endowed with divine nature. So these 26 divine qualities, this is what we achieve when we render bhakti or devotional service in Krishna consciousness. Throughout Bhagavad Gita, Krishna has been emphasizing repeatedly that it is devotional service which is the ultimate and preferred activity for the conditioned soul. And by executing devotional service or Krishna consciousness, these 26 divine qualities will develop. It's not that one has to practice these qualities separately or independently. These qualities are there part and parcel of the pure soul. Right now, the pure soul is contaminated by material association and identification. So as one practices devotional service or Krishna consciousness, the purification of the senses, the body, the mind begins. And little by little, these natural qualities of the soul will begin to exhibit themselves. Especially if one engages in reading Bhagavad Gita or hearing Bhagavad Gita and also chanting Krishna's holy name, then these qualities will begin to sprout. Therefore, it is very important that every day one read Bhagavad Gita and chant Krishna's holy name. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Now, in verses 4 through 6, Krishna will make a comparison between divine and demoniac qualities. Pride, arrogance, overbearing pride evidenced by a superior manner toward inferiors. Conceit, or having an exaggerated sense of self-importance, anger, harshness, and ignorance. These qualities belong to those of demoniac nature, O son of Prita. So there were 26 divine qualities, and Krishna only gave right now six of the demoniac qualities. Later on, he will give a more extensive description. But for comparison's sake, he has just mentioned these main six. Now he makes the comparison. The transcendental qualities are conducive to liberation, whereas the demoniac qualities make for bondage. So this is significant. 
By becoming godly or divine, one becomes free from the laws of material nature, the modes that we discussed previously in chapter 14. And by cultivating the demoniac qualities, one becomes further and further entangled and bound up in the reactions of the material laws. Do not worry, O son of Pandu, for you are born with divine qualities. So Krishna is reassuring Arjuna that his nature is divine. O son of Pitta, in this world there are two kinds of created beings. One is called the divine and the other demoniac. So when Krishna uses the word created beings, he is referring to the spirit soul conditioned by a material body and mind and senses. The spirit soul as it is, is eternal. This we've discussed several times. The spirit soul has no birth because it is eternal, just like God Krishna himself. But because the conditioned soul takes birth after birth after birth in the material world, transmigrating through 8,400,000 different species or different types of bodies, then the term created being is used to indicate the soul is transmigrating. I have already explained to you at length the divine qualities. Now hear from me of the demoniac. So in verses 7 through 15, Krishna will give us a glimpse into the mentality and nature of the demon. Those who are demoniac do not know what is to be done and what is not to be done. Neither cleanliness nor proper behavior nor truth is found in them. So there are two kinds of cleanliness, internal and external. External means to keep the body and one's clothes and working area and environment clean. And internal cleanliness means to keep the mind, the internal sense, free from contamination. If one studies Bhagavad Gita and begins to practice it, especially the chanting of Krishna's holy name, then the mind and the internal senses, the subtle body, will remain pure and fresh and clean, just like a clean mirror. Many times the mind or the consciousness is compared to a mirror. And when we are in material consciousness, that mirror of the heart, the mirror of the mind, is covered by dust and dirt. But by the cleansing process of devotional service, especially hearing and chanting about Krishna, then that dirt and dust is cleansed from the mirror of the heart and when fully cleansed, one can see oneself as well as Krishna who dwells within the heart. They say that this world is unreal with no foundation and no God in control. They say it is produced of sex desire and has no cause other than lust. And by the way, lust, what is lust? Here are some definitions of lust. Sinful longing, the inward sin which leads to the falling away from God. Lust, the origin of sin, has its place in the heart, not of necessity, but because it is the center of all moral forces and impulses and spiritual activity. Lust, the object of desire. And we learned in chapter 3 that this lust, where is it hiding? Because Krishna reminded us that lust is public enemy number one. The greatest enemy of the conditioned soul is lust. And where is it hiding? In the mind, in the intelligence, and the senses. Following such conclusions, the demoniac, who are lost to themselves and who have no intelligence, engage in unbeneficial, horrible works meant to destroy the world. 
So when Krishna says they have no intelligence, he's referring to the kind of intelligence which he explained at the beginning of Bhagavad Gita. The demons have material intelligence, but according to Bhagavad Gita, material intelligence is not intelligent because material intelligence only guarantees you repeated birth and death. Krishna's definition of intelligence is that process by which you extricate yourself from the bondage of repeated birth and death, liberation. And this was explained in chapter 2 as buddhi yoga, the linking process with God through means of spiritual intelligence. That is the process of devotional service, Krishna consciousness, beginning with hearing Bhagavad Gita and chanting Krishna's name. The demons are very expert in material affairs, but their expertise only gives them yet another term of imprisonment in this material tabernacle. And Krishna said, unbeneficial, horrible works meant to destroy the world. Yes, here Krishna is giving us an indication of atomic bombs. These bombs have no purpose other than destroying life. Krishna continues, taking shelter of insatiable lust. We learned that in chapter three, he said, Krishna said, lust is never to be satisfied and it burns like fire. And absorbed in the conceit of pride and false prestige, the demoniac, thus illusion, are always sworn to unclean work attracted by the impermanent. We learned in chapter two that the material energy is impermanent. All the manifestations of the material world, including one's body and mind, is temporary. It's not eternal. The soul, that is eternal. God, that is eternal. But the demoniac are not interested in God and the soul. They deny the existence of God and the soul. They are caught up, wrapped up in simply studying and exploiting this temporary, impermanent material energy. They believe that to gratify the senses is the prime necessity of human civilization. So the demoniac are 180 degrees opposite to what Krishna has been teaching throughout Bhagavad Gita. Krishna has been condemning sense gratification all throughout and has advised Arjuna to give up sense gratification, to become transcendental, to be situated in the self. But the demoniac, just the opposite, they think the whole purpose of life is to enjoy the body and gratify the sensory demands. Thus, until the end of life, their anxiety is immeasurable, bound by a network of hundreds and thousands of desires, absorbed in lust and anger. They secure money by illegal means for sense gratification. So we learned previously in chapter two that lust, because it will not be satisfied, one will always be frustrated. And after frustration, one must become angry. So because the demons have taken sense gratification, as you could say, their religion, they will always be under this mode of anger. And we see many examples in the Vedas, Hiranyakashipu, Ravan, Kamsa. They were the greatest materialists, atheists, and they were always experiencing unlimited desires that could never be fulfilled. And as a result, always very angry. And Krishna said they secure money by illegal means. Sometimes governments also become influenced by demoniac propensities. And they also secure money by illegal means. History has shown this time and time again, for history does repeat itself. 
Now in this next few verses, Krishna will give us a glimpse into the mind, the mentality of a demon. Krishna says, here's how a demon thinks. So much wealth do I have today and I will gain more according to my schemes. So much is mine now and it will increase in the future more and more. He is my enemy and I've killed him. And my other enemies will also be killed. I am the Lord of everything. I am the enjoyer. I am perfect, powerful and happy. I am the richest man surrounded by aristocratic relatives. There is none so powerful and happy as I am. I shall perform sacrifices. I shall give some charity and thus I shall rejoice. Now Krishna certainly knows the mentality of a demon because Krishna is within the heart of the demon. In the previous chapter we learned that Krishna causes remembrance, knowledge and forgetfulness for every living entity, whether one be a saint or a dacoit. So Krishna certainly knows what the demon thinks because he's also in their hearts. And it is Krishna who is helping the demon how to become a better and better demon. Krishna gives them the knowledge. Krishna helps them to forget God and Krishna reminds them of so many material desires because that's what they want. Krishna does not interfere with their independence. The living entity makes up the decision that I want to be a demon, that I want to forget God and then God gives them the intelligence and remembrance and forgetfulness necessary how to accomplish that. In this way, such persons are deluded by ignorance. So Krishna here confirms that to be a demon means to be ignorant. Now in verses 16 through 20, Krishna explains what becomes of a demon, what happens to them. Thus perplexed by various anxieties and bound by a network of illusions, they become too strongly attached to sense enjoyment and fall down into hell. So here is a very important point. The path to hell begins by pursuing sense enjoyment. And as you pursue it more and more, gradually the way the laws of nature work because of pursuing sense gratification you glide down deeper and deeper into the hellish material existence listen carefully self-complacent content to a fault and always impudent improperly forward or bold Deluded by wealth and false prestige, they sometimes proudly perform sacrifices in name only without following any rules or regulations. Yes, the demons do not care for God, the saintly man or the scriptures, but they know that if I perform some ceremony, I might become very popular or famous. So in name, just for an external show, they may do some so-called religious activity or ritual. But actually, they don't follow the prescribed rules and regulations because they deny the Vedas, the scriptures, and God. Bewildered by false ego. We explained false ego just to remind you. Ego we cannot do away with because the soul is eternally an individual. True ego is I'm the eternal part and parcel servant of Krishna. False ego is I'm not the eternal part and parcel servant of Krishna. I am something else. 
I am something designated by my material body, mind, and senses. So the demons, because they denied the existence of God and the soul, must be under the impression of false ego. Bewildered by strength, pride, lust, and anger, the demons become envious of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And as I mentioned previously, envy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, that is the original sin. Originally, all souls were in the kingdom of God, but because the soul wants to usurp the position of God, wants to become God, him or herself, then the soul enters the material world. And it all began with this original sin, envy of Krishna as the supreme enjoyer, supreme proprietor, and supreme friend. The demon becomes envious of God who is situated in their heart and in the bodies of others and blasphemes against the real religion. What is the real religion? The real religion is not Hindu, Christian, Jew, Muslim, Buddhist. No, there is only one real religion. That religion, that real religion is being explained throughout 18 chapters of Bhagavad Gita. That real religion is love God, surrender to God exclusively. And that is what Krishna has been repeatedly saying to Arjuna and through Arjuna, Krishna is speaking to the entire human society. The only one real religion is to surrender to Krishna by practice of Krishna consciousness, devotional service, beginning by hearing and chanting Bhagavad Gita and Krishna's holy name. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. But the demon will try to deny this. And not only that, the demon will try to stop others from practicing Bhagavad Gita and Krishna consciousness. The demon is not content just to avoid God himself. The demon also wants to prevent others from worshiping God. Those who are envious and mischievous, who are the lowest among men, I perpetually cast into the ocean of material existence into various demoniac species of life. Krishna here is explaining what eventually happens to the demon. The human form of life was given to the conditioned soul as a means to liberate himself. But instead, the conditioned soul cultivated further material qualities and desires. The human form is not designed for sense gratification. The human body is designed for liberation. So if as a human being, I simply cultivate material animalistic propensities, then Krishna, as his move, as his reciprocation, then gives me another kind of material body whereby I can enjoy my material propensities to the fullest extent. Whether it be sex or intoxication or meat eating or gambling or any sinful activity. If I really cultivate these, then Krishna will give me a lower form, an animal form by which I can enjoy these to the fullest extent. For instance, if someone is indiscriminate in the matter of eating, then better that person take the next birth, not as a human being, but as a hog. If one is indiscriminate in uh, sexual enjoyment, then such a person does not deserve a human form. Better to take birth as a pigeon, a sparrow, or a monkey, where there is full facility for sex, and so on. Whatever material sinful activity I become uh, very much inclined towards, Krishna will give me an appropriate body to experience those illicit desires. Krishna continues. Attaining repeated birth amongst the species of demoniac life, such persons 
can never approach me. Gradually, they sink down to the most abominable type of existence. So this is what happens to the demon. He cultivates more and more materialism, more and more atheism, and therefore goes deeper and more down into the material world. Now, in the remaining section of this chapter, verses 21 through 24, Krishna will explain how to escape going to hell. There are three gates leading to hell. Lust, anger, and greed. Every sane man should give these up, for they lead to the degradation of the soul. We learned in chapter 6, the mind can be one's friend or one's enemy. The uncontrolled mind is one's greatest enemy. And we learned also, lust is sinful enemy number one. And lust is residing in the mind. So the purpose of human life is elevation. The purpose of human life is to develop love of God, God consciousness, Krishna consciousness. So by lust, anger, and greed, one is ensuring a ticket to hell. And as Krishna said, if you're sane, you'll want to give up going to hell. But if you're insane, if you're too attached to enjoying the body, mind, and senses, then you have purchased your ticket to hell. The choice is yours. One who has escaped these three gates of hell, lust, anger, and greed, performs acts conducive to self-realization and thus gradually attains the supreme destination. The supreme destination has been mentioned several times by Krishna. It is the kingdom of God, the planet of Krishna, where everyone is loving and serving Krishna without any stoppage. And how to go there? Acts conducive to self-realization. That's what Bhagavad Gita has been extolling. Self-realization is there when you engage in Krishna consciousness, especially hearing Bhagavad Gita and chanting Krishna's holy name. One who discards scriptural injunctions and acts according to one's own whims attains neither perfection nor happiness nor the supreme destination. So the scriptures are there to guide human society. The scriptures are there to help as a roadmap for the path of liberation. But if one gives up following the scriptures, then one is simply acting out of one's own whims. Then one will certainly get lost. One will not achieve perfection. One will not achieve liberation. One will not return home back to Godhead. You'll be lost in this material world forever. So it is very important to know the Vedic scriptures and to not just know them, but to follow them. That's why we have been saying all along, Bhagavad Gita is a summary of all the Vedas. If you simply follow this one book, Bhagavad Gita, if you simply engage in Krishna consciousness, then you will achieve perfection in this life. So simply read and hear Bhagavad Gita and chant Krishna's holy name incessantly. And now, finally, Krishna says, One should therefore understand what is your duty and what is not your duty by the regulations of the scriptures. Knowing such rules and regulations, you should act so that you may gradually be elevated. Yes, we learned in chapter 6, gradually, step by step, one becomes situated in trance. The stage of trance is the ultimate perfection. So, Krishna here said, you should know the rules and regulations so that you know how to act properly. 
Therefore, every day read Bhagavad Gita and chant Krishna's holy name. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare.